Hello everyone, welcome to today's episode of the Carb Strong Cast. Okay, so today's guest is a guest who I've had on before, Dr. Michelle Lowe, who's a PhD psychologist and lecturer. And today we're going to talk about different activism methods, how the few can influence the many, certain effects in psychology which help people change. And I really do think this is an important podcast to sit through because we really go over uh, some of the objections people have with certain types of activism, how activism works, how people change, um, aggressive activism, you know, uh, different types of activism, diluting the the message, what that does to the message. So please sit back. If you've got some time, chuck the headphones on, listen to this one in its entirety, and I guarantee you'll leave with some value. So enjoy. Okay, welcome everybody to this interview with one of my friends and comrades in the movement, Dr. Michelle Lowe. How are you going, Michelle? Hi, I'm very well, thank you. So I thought I'd get you on to discuss some things that you might have some expertise in or at least have researched a lot about, and that's um, the way activism works, the way social change works. Can you just explain to people what you do and what your expertise is? Yeah, I'm an academic psychologist. I work at a UK university. I specialise in forensic and social psychology. So that involves crime, but it also involves a lot about social change, um, social justice. Um, I've done research for the last 20, yeah, 20 years now, um, not specifically on activism or on veganism, but the, the theories, the concepts, the perspectives used in social psychology really map really closely onto the way that the vegan activism movement works and is moving forward. So um, I feel that I can use my expertise in social psychology for the good uh, within the vegan movement. Wow. So yeah. um, I've, got a, I've got a YouTube channel and uh, that's vegan based. It's not solely vegan, um, but it's vegan based. And I cover some key concepts within some of the videos that relate to the social psychology of vegan activism. Okay, well, I guess we'll start with how the few can influence the many and what that's takes what that takes and what that has taken in history um can you explain a little bit about that yeah um minority influence that's what we call it in social psychology so there was a french social psychologist way back in the in the 60s i think um called moscovici and he said that there's a number of principles that if put in place the few the minority can begin to influence the many. So his kind of, um, the theory that he built up around this uh, minority influence was quite starkly against the social psychological movement that had developed in America, which was all about the majority and the force of the majority. So Moscovici's work is still, um, it's still current and it's been extended a lot in, in more recent times. But we do know that there are, there are several basic principles that a minority group can put in place to begin to influence a majority in the most influential way. Okay. What so are I can ex- principles? Well, for example, um, if a group, a minority group, is consistent with their message mm-hmm. and they are they are there there has to be a move towards that area anyway otherwise you just get i suppose you just get banded as being a you know a, a, a fringe a lunatic fringe right so there has to be a social movement going in that direction to begin with but a minority group can start to steer that direction by being consistent by putting an argument together that is incredibly difficult to refute so that might come from it might come from science it might come from society but a a collection of principles put together that are difficult to refute from different angles but that consistent message comes over Um, that's the the bedrock of Moscovici's theory on minority influence. There are other things as well um, that can be debated, um, but in more recent years, the, the area of minority influence has been used a lot in marketing. 
in terms of you know advertising to get people to buy a product so i think in terms of um vegan activism some of those principles that have been investigated in relation to the social psychology of persuasion they are key so as well as having the consistent message and a message that is so accurate and it's difficult to refute there's also a, a, a number of other things that can be put in place by activists that will assist in that process so for example in the mid 1980s um, a couple of social psychologists called uh, Petty and Cacioppo, um, they published a set of papers outlining the way that but it's all been used in advertising, but it can be used in any form of persuasion. Uh, they put together a model in which they said to persuade someone into your way of thinking. It's incredibly difficult because, you know, people can deny, they can, they can kind of backtrack and so on and so forth. But it, it brings in what Moscovici said about consistency that if, um, if you have an audience that is listening to you, there's two ways, there's two ways that they can think about the issues. They can elaborate on it, so they can take an elaborate way, an elaborate social cognitive process and really think through the arguments. And if they're willing to do that, then there are certain things that can assist with that level of persuasion. And if that's successful, that change in attitude tends to be stronger, more long lasting, and, um, and, and uh, I suppose potentially permanent. So that's called the central route of persuasion. So to get someone to think deeply through those, um, th through the, the issues that might be arising, the things that they might have to challenge in themselves, that they have to challenge their own attitudes, their own socialization, for example, um, then you want to think about things like the strength of the message. So this brings in what Moscovici said about the consistency and the robustness of the message. So is, does that message stand up to scrutiny? So the message itself needs to be strong. But there's also other things as well that have been investigated, that have been studied to death in relation to advertising. But these can include things like who is the person delivering the message? So is the person delivering the message, the source of the message, are they credible? Do they have, for example, a level of expertise? Do they have a level of authority? do they have a, a, a standing within that movement as a as a leader as someone who is respected or are they considered an expert in the field so for example if if let's say for example the government wanted to i don't know stop people smoking and they, and they started a um anti-smoking campaign then part of that would be to get people to really think about the issues relating to smoking so they'd want people to think through the possible negative outcomes of smoking, like lung cancer and heart disease and so on. And to get them to deliver that message, you would incorporate a series of experts. So you might have a medical set of experts, but there, are, there would be a certain group, and I'll come on to the audience effects in a moment, but there would be certain groups of people who would be better influenced by different types of people. So for example, you might have like middle-aged or older people who would be, they'd listen to a medical professional. They'd listen to someone who had the degrees, they had the, you know, they had the research behind them. But there'd be other members of the, community of the population who wouldn't care a jot what a medic said actually they would listen more to somebody maybe who was closer to their age or closer to their um you know someone that they looked up to so it could be a professional footballer it could be someone in a celebrity it could be pop stars um 
So the, the person delivering the message, there is never going to be one person that can deliver that message successfully to everybody. So it's about kind of like, if you're putting a campaign together, like a, a government putting an anti-smoking campaign together, they'd kind of use a whole series of different levels of supposed experts or people who were respected. The audience itself, the audience, the people who are receiving that message, um, they can, you know, it tends to be people who are really, really, really intelligent, like the really high flying people within the community who are the most difficult to, pers to persuade, strangely enough, because they're the ones who will bring up the most obtuse arguments. They'd be the most difficult people to argue down. But in general, in general terms, then really you kind of have to kind of think about matching the audience to the person delivering the message. But ultimately, it's all about the message itself. Everything else is secondary to the message itself. If the message, as Muscovici said, if the message is consistent and it's clear, it's accurate, it can't be refuted, then that message stands and people can choose to take that message forward and look at it deeply and start investigating it themselves or they can leave it behind. Um, the other way that persuasion can happen is through a peripheral routes. So it can be people jumping on a bandwagon. It can be the latest trend. Therefore, you know, if you're, if you're selling like jeans or you're selling the, the, the latest foam and all you want is a sale, then you can, you can advertise your products through the peripheral route. So it's making it look glossy and shiny and this is the newest thing this is the this is a thing you really want to make your life complete right really shallow types of message but that type of persuasion could be successful to get people to buy a new phone but it doesn't keep them loyal to that brand it doesn't keep them coming back for more it doesn't change their attitudes really at all it, it really just it, 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 it does what it, you know, what, what it's needed for that purpose is to buy a phone. But if you think about it in terms of social movements, like veganism or stopping people smoking, it's less successful, it's less useful to get people to process in that shallow way because it's not going to stick. So if veganism becomes like a, a trend amongst a certain group of people, yeah, people who uh, identify with that group are going to give it a try, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to change their attitudes. It doesn't necessarily mean they're going to learn about veganism, learn about the ethics and the morality and what actually happens in farming, what actually happens in slaughterhouses, because all they're doing is processing that message shallowly mm. and they're not prepared or not able for whatever reason, they're not able to, change their opinion and for that that change in their behavior to become permanent well wow. so that's why i think we see a lot of people within within veganism who very quickly leave veganism because their friends are doing it they see it as a trend there's yep. a pop star that's doing it there's yep. and they and they leave it so yeah of course you are going to get people who have a goal do it for a week do it for a month and they leave but in terms of building up an activist movement, what we really should be getting people to think through are the issues and to focus on the central route of persuasion. That would be my advice to vegan activists, that it's all very well to, you know, show that you can build big muscles and you can be, you know, <laughs> you can be more sexy and you can be more attractive by being plant-based, but that doesn't, it doesn't invite people in the same way as putting a really, a really strong, accurate, ethical message forward. Well, the research you're actually, would suggest we need the ethics it, it, um, to go on. I was just going to say that you're actually confirming a lot of the things that we've discussed um, that I've gone over with other activists about. And that's the fact that when you dilute 
the message to reach a larger pool of people. Say you want to reach a yeah. larger population. So you're diluting the message. You're censoring yourself. You're not being honest to avoid any feelings getting riled up. All of those things dilute the message to the point. You might get a larger, larger following. So you might, influence more people but on a surface level so you've then diluted that's your message right. that it's less effective on average yeah that's right and also that's like right. let's just say so, I have, yeah if, has a smaller following with a very explicit hardcore um true message hard to argue evidence-based and they're um they're standing strong in their con uh, convictions and delivering a very a powerful animal rights message that that is come with the slaughterhouse footage versus someone who says hey give it a try you know cut out this here and there you know a little bit of a diluted flaky message to maybe be be more liked and to sort of catch more people in that doesn't necessarily that mean it's going to be more effective mm, on average yeah that's absolutely the case yeah um that we've kind of got to we've got to tease two things apart here because we've got veganism, which is the ethical movement, yeah. which is calling for the end, the abolition of exploitation and cruelty to animals. And then you've got a slightly different type of message, which I would consider it to be reducitarian, yeah. that let's cut down on the amount of meat you eat, let's cut down on the amount of eggs you have every week, let's try plant-based milks instead of dairy, because they're better for you. The research suggests that, you know, you're more likely to have heart disease and high cholesterol if you eat lots of meat and put it down, put it down. And veganism, ve vegans can use health arguments. I've no problem with vegans using arguments like that or using bodybuilders to advertise the plant-based movement. Um, because it does, it does open up the door to types of people, groups of people who would never have considered plant-based living or plant-based foods mm -hmm. or giving up animal protein. So yeah, that's all, that's all well and good. That's fine. But if that's all you're doing, that is all you're doing, you might be reaching a wider audience. And some of those, some of those might begin to think through well, if I don't need, if I don't need meat to be strong and to be fit and to play my sport, then why am I eating it when I know that the animals are suffering because of it? So yeah, you, you will get, if you, if you spread your net widely, you will get a proportion of those who will take it upon themselves to do that research. Possibly because at some point in their life, they've encountered a vegan message they've encountered maybe somebody stopping them in the street and saying you know have you considered this have you considered what animals go through but they've set it aside because they're a bodybuilder and well i understand that animals are suffering but i need it because i'm a bodybuilder so once that's that it it's made clear to them through a through a different argument that actually you don't need animal protein to become strong and fit and, and to carry on in your sport then they can go back to the message that they heard at some point in the past that they'd put to one side that they'd not thought anything really of and that is in social psychology is called the sleeper effect so there's, there's, several, there's several things that I think social psychology can bring forward here to explain why some people will just go vegan like that based on some seemingly very shallow type of message, such as, look, John Venus is strong, or um, look at Derek Simner and he's strong, and just looking at the aesthetics and you think why has that person just looking at something that's seemingly quite shallow why has that person decided to not only give up animal foods give up animal protein but also they've taken on an ethical stance they've 
for whatever reason, gone forward and taught themselves, gone away and done the research themselves. And for people who are spreading the net widely, they can use those kind of anecdotes that, yeah, there is, there are a few people who will use that really quite shallow message that initially and become ethical vegans, right? And they'll say, all we have to do is spread our net widely and a few of those, you know, throw, throw more darts at the dartboard and the more likely you are to get a hit. But I would suspect, based on psychology, I would suspect that those few people who do convert permanently, change their attitudes and become ethical vegans are people who have heard messages before at some point in the past that were ethical messages, mm -hmm. but they've denied them, they've put them to one side because of this effect that we, we call the sleeper effect. That you can hear a message that's really powerful and really strong, but you, you back away from it at first because you're not, you're not ready, you're not ready to hear it, you're not prepared to hear it, it doesn't apply to you, or I can't do it because I'm a bodybuilder type thing, or I can't do it because I'm whatever. Um, but that message has sat there somewhere in their brain and then at some point in the future, it could be months, it could be years, at some point in the future, it come, they're, they're triggered again and it comes back to them. And it's the message that they remember. So however way we look at this, whether we are looking at spreading the net widely or whether we're looking at having more targeted campaigns that focus on you know, the real powerful impact of showing slaughterhouse footage. Whichever way you dress it up, whichever route you take, it always comes down to the message, always comes down to the message. Because even if that message doesn't look successful to the vast majority of people initially, there will be some of those people via the sleeper effect who have denied it at first and at some point then in the future will have remembered that message and will take it upon themselves to go away and do their own research. And it's that permanent attitude change I think we need um, because those are the people who will be the force to take the movement forward. The people who just want to try veganism because they think, oh, well, I've got a little bit of high cholesterol or I, I, want, to get, I want to get big muscles and I've watched Game Changers, right? Those people, the vast majority of those people with no other message behind it, with no substance behind it, they're not going to become vegan. They might try a plant-based diet for a month, but they're not going to become vegan. Yeah, it's not by so, the definition of what a vegan is anyway. They might have a idea of what they think a vegan is, but they might not be full, fully practicing in, you know, clothing and, you know, they might be having a bit of animal products here and there and just declaring they're a vegan because they got a diluted message to begin with. But what I think what, so what you're saying is that people that are, th th there's this theory that by advocating health and environment, you're more likely to um, draw people in to go vegan, but how are they supposed to make that full transition to a, a completely practicing vegan if they've never had the actual message that will get them there? They they can only they can only be sort of a plant based version of what a vegan actually is, but maybe multi, uh, majority plant based eating or something like that. But until they get that message, wherever it might be. Um, from whatever angle they come in, they have to get that message to take it seriously and, and, and fully practice it. So That's when right. people go, well, you should be advocating just for health or you should be advocating for environment so as to not turn people off. The, the people that come in through health and environment, they find the ethical message and that's what solidifies it. Or it's the other way around. They get the ethical message from someone like us or whoever it is in the movement. They might yeah. not take it on right. They, they, they get the message. It's in their brain. They don't change. And then these other more surface level aspects hit them, which might cover one of their objections, their multiple objections. And then they change because they've originally heard the message. Yeah. Yeah. It all comes down to the message, delivering the message. Mm. So even though it might seem demoralizing, and it might seem off-putting to some people to deliver that very powerful message, it's that message that vegans need to deliver. Whether they upset people or not, they need to deliver that message. So if we now, talk about that, talk about 
what if this sleep, this sleeper effect that you're talking about, it's like a seed, like I used to call it a seed being planted. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. 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 And then it flourishes later. The sleeper, yeah, effect, wake, they it. wake up, but that that's seed is what's in your mind. And so talk about people that, because sometimes I can be considered abrasive. I can be considered aggressive and all those things, but my message is always predominantly the same. It's the same message. Mm. And people perceive my attitude in different ways. And they might go across, leave a little bit angry or people might watch the video and be a bit angry. And I get an angry comment. I get a lot of angry comments. Um, you know, how dare you? And they might attack my character, but not attack the message. And just did that, did that um, then invalidate that message or that work that I did? Because some people might be angry with it or does it still hold true that the sleeper effect will manifest? It still holds true. It still holds true. If you were going around abusing people and making claims that were not valid just to get people to listen to you, then that's not good vegan activism. If your message is could come across as abrasive or blunt or rude, but that message is clear, it's informative, it's accurate, it's verifiable, those facts stand regardless of who delivered that message. Now, of course, as I, as I said before, there are, um, in the literature, there are research studies that will say, you know, if you want people to really listen to you, you've got to come across as credible, you've got to come across as an expert in your field. But experts, as I, as I said before, experts in the field are people considered credible can be determined by the person listening to the message. So you can't change the way the person you are, you can't change. I would suggest that if you try to change the way that you deliver your message, and in doing that, you weakened your message, I think that does the message a disservice. It's much better to be true to yourself, be passionate, to be credible and to say, look, I've, I've been to slaughterhouses, I've seen what happens, I've been an activist for X number of years, and this is reality, that's much more powerful than someone who comes along and says, well, if you give up meat, you know, you'll be, you'll be healthy, ah, and by the way, some animals won't die right because that doesn't deliver the vegan message it, it delivers a message but it doesn't deliver a powerful message that will plant that seed and i think that the activists within the vegan movement at the moment i think there are different styles but that's that's fine that's fine um but they are delivering a consistent message and it's that consistency that we need. It not all comes down, all comes down to the message. Not, not everyone is delivering a consistent message and it kind of um, does create a little bit, it cloudies the message a little bit because when you go out to the wider, wider audience, uh, the wider um, vegan arena, there's mm. a very clouded view of what a vegan actually is, which is why you get people mispracticing veganism with that because they haven't. That's true. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, I, I would say that, um, I, I made a comment in a video the other day and I said, I consider the plant-based doctors like Michael Greger and, and so on as allies of the vegan movement. Mm. Because although they occasionally mention ethics, their message, their, the way they make their money, the way, the way their career has been put forward in the media is one of a medic, one of a, a plant-based doctor. So they, they've got a health message, right? So they're an ally of the vegan movement and we can use their expertise. We can use what they, what they are saying about, you know, the research on cholesterol or the research on heart disease. We can use that, but we can't put that in place instead of the vegan message. It's in addition to the vegan message. I agree. They're a very valuable ally and, Without this research, we really wouldn't know how to respond to a lot of these yeah. arguments. So that it isn't a bolstering message and it's an addition, but the core message has to remain the same. 
I was just wondering, like, with this uh, sleeper effect, and you said the main thing is the message and they receive the message, and when it flourishes, it flourishes. It might be sooner, it might be a little bit later, depending on a certain number of factors. What do you think of, I've heard this in psychology, something called the backfire effect, where a message is taken abrasively and they double down and less likely to be persuaded to change their behavior. What do you think of that? Yeah, that is a thing. Um, that is something that can happen um, when somebody's not ready to listen to that message. Okay. So you might have somebody who, I mean, I did this myself. Um, I was a vegetarian for a long time. I tried veganism. I fell off the vegan wagon, but I continued to be vegetarian. But for many years, I knew, I knew what was going on in the dairy industry and I chose to deny it. And if someone had at certain points during those years that I was denying, if someone had come along and, and show me a photograph of a cow, um, you know, having her calf taken away from her, I would have said, yeah, that's horrible, but, and I would very, very strongly have put that boat in place and I would have doubled down on my efforts to deny. So you're always going to have people who are not ready. So I think the backfire effect is a demonstration of people who are not ready. Okay. And you are going to have many people who will never be ready to listen to a vegan message because they might not even like animals, right? They just think, well, animals are things that we share a planet with and I'd rather them not really be here and yeah. you know they're much lesser lesser importance and the only reason why we should have animals is for human usage there are people who believe that and strongly believe that those people are never never going to change so we've got to accept as vegans we've got to accept that there are some people who will never change yeah. and there are everybody else in the middle right who are at varying levels of willingness to listen. Yeah. So I think, like I said, the backfire effect is that demonstration of somebody who is partway there. I would suggest that the backfire effect is a demonstration of someone who knows the truth, but is not ready yet to listen to it. He's not ready yet to fully commit to it. That might be because they've been influenced by peers. It might be because they, they don't believe that, you know, they might, they might have this strange opinion that all vegans are wacky and just hippies and, you know, that's not me kind of thing. Um, but again, that can, that can be countered by various things. It can be countered by showing people actually that vegans come from all walks of life. They come from... A wide variety of backgrounds the vegan movement is is diverse and uh, and that in that, that in itself can look very very shallow but what you've got backing up what you've got behind it is the message the sleeper effect so, so does this, doesn't the yeah. backfire doesn't the sleeper effect kind of contradict the backfire effect because they no, got I, and they backfired and then what happens later I, on when I, I don't think it does. I think it, I think it complements. I think you, you have people who are not prepared to listen because it's too horrible to watch starter host footage. Yeah. But they know, they know that they are playing into, they are buying products that are harming animals. Yeah. And they're not prepared to watch slaughterhouse footage and they back away and they they put their wall up and it, what it feels like to the activist is that their efforts in getting someone to um to listen has backfired because it's made them stronger you know they, they you know well the more you shout at me the more you try to show me this horrible footage the less likely i am to go vegan well, they were never going to go vegan anyway. They're just using this, they're using this wall, this wall of anger, because actually they, they feel guilty. They're in denial, they feel guilty. So I think those people, if you get that reaction, I think that seed has been planted. Yeah, so the, the sleeper effect can still come into play even after exactly. the fire effect. Exactly, 
And actually, I, I, I couldn't cite any research to back this up. This is just my opinion. But I would suggest that people who have a really strong backfire effect are the ones who are the most likely in the future once they've got over, once they've jumped over that wall mm. and that final straw has been put in place, those are the ones who feel strongly. Because if they didn't feel strongly, they wouldn't have had that aggressive reaction exactly. in the first place. Exactly right. And the apathetic people who don't care, don't comment, they don't watch, they don't stop and debate, they just walk yeah. past, they're apathetic. Like yeah. the ones who come at me or go who who spend their lives commenting rah, 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 or they, yeah. they leave they watch one of my things or they leave a bad like people say well you're turning people away well they got the message <laughs> so yeah. they're turning yeah, away yeah. with the message in their mind you know that's right it just that's it, right i used to feel like sometimes well when you when i was on tv and i reached such a lot such a wider audience a really wide audience this is when i really see the backlash of being on a straight to the point direct and I yeah. would get a lot of people, oh my God, this guy, I can't believe him. Now, when their anger subsides, when their idea of me and how I made them feel subsides and all they're left with is that message, that's when the magic happens, isn't it? That's right. That's right. And you might never see that. You might never see that change. So to you, you're, you're left with, oh, I've upset a lot of people and you know the media are on my back and I'm getting all this negative press. But you don't see the time when that person, uh, for whatever reason, wakes up and thinks, hold on a minute, why am I eating this? Why am I eating steak? Why am I doing this? Mm -hmm. And that final penny has dropped. You don't see that, but it would have been your message that it would have been a, a large contributor mm -hmm. to that person eventually becoming vegan. Like, and like I said, I think the stronger the, stronger the reaction they have, yeah. Whether that's disgust or anger, I think those are the people who are most likely in their own time, they might need time to back away and go and think it through themselves, do the research. But those are the people who, who are the, the most reachable. Have you ever been in a situation where like a friend has told you something that is so true and so honest that you got so angry at them? And then yeah. later on, you started to like think about it and go, well, shit they're they're right like what am i going to say you know like it's happened to me yeah. a few times like so yeah. i've seen it in action in other things where people are just blunt and honest they say how it really is they don't worry about all this pandering and changing their personality to the point diluting the message to the point where like trying to beg people to like you and like oh my god i don't want to upset anyone like what do you think about what do you think about um trying to focus on being liked as an activism method versus on being versus being honest with that strong message i think if somebody is just has got a likable personality and you know they've got an attractive way about them that's fine that's great mm. but they've got to be delivering a strong message if they're coming across as being likable and lovely and a little bit soft around the edges, but alongside that is nothing, alongside that is just this really di dilute message, what is the point? What is the point in being liked when what you actually want is people to go vegan? What is the point? There's no reason to be likable. Mm. It, doesn't, it doesn't serve the purpose. No, it, it, it's, it, it's great if you have somebody who is, um, who is able to deliver a message to a wide number of people and to, you know, some people just very eloquent speakers. Standing up delivering a talk, for example, you know, it's, it stands to reason to put someone up on stage who is very eloquent, who is very clear, who can speak very plainly. But if you put that same person perhaps in a different environment, maybe you know, in a, a five minute TV interview, that level of eloquence might be lost because they don't have the time to be able to deliver the, the, the points forcefully enough. So the, the place, the location in which the message is being delivered 
can also be a, a factor in how best to deliver that message. If you've got five minutes, then it's much better to go in and deliver those points clearly, forcefully, very directly. If you've got a lecture slot, if you're doing a lecture series and you've got 30 minutes or 40 minutes or you're delivering a TED talk and you've got 20 minutes, well, you can spend longer. You can spend longer engaging with the audience, you know, being a bit more personable because you've got time to do that. Mm. But that's only relevant, that's only necessary if you have the time, the scope, and you're in the appropriate setting for that to take place. Mm. But if you don't team that with a strong message, you are, quite frankly, wasting your time. So, Michelle, like, what, what my problem is with focusing on being liked is that they sacrifice the message to be liked because they yeah. think the message will make people not like them. And that is what the pro like, of course you got to be likable to a certain extent, but not to the point that where you're sacrificing the message and not telling people what they need to hear the message, the animals need them to hear. Mm, that's absolutely the case. I mean, um, I don't know whether you've seen it, but um, vegan games has been exchanging some, um, response videos and he did a live stream the other night um, where um, some guy, I don't even know whether, whether he's a gamer or something um, called Penguin something or other. I don't know who he is. I'd never heard of him before. Um, and it, apparently this Penguin person has got a large following and uh, on YouTube and he'd made a video about the uh, the, the absolutely gross you know like um there's a, there's someone called soy young yeah. who is eating live animals on screen yeah. and he this penguin guy made a video about soy young but in the background there was like kfc so vegan gains made a video saying you're a hypocrite yeah because you know what's what is the difference between so young eating an octopus on screen that you find so repulsive and you eating chicken yeah. because there's no difference. It's just the only difference yeah. is you've got somebody to do that killing for you. Yeah. Yep. So vegan games did a live stream and he got tons and tons of trolls into the chat. It was pretty hilarious, but I don't know how Richard kept his, kept his cool. He really did. But back in the day when Richard was much more, um, much more controversial than he is now, I think he was on the verge of putting people off, you know, like stomping babies and things like that. They yeah. always come back to bite him. But all he's done is torn down a little bit. He's still as forceful, he's still as aggressive, mm. he's still as unlikable to many people, but he's incredibly effective at what he does because his message is consistent and his message is delivered in a consistent way across different types of people that he was able to engage and made a lot of money out of super chats. Yeah. Uh, these trolls like coming in with super chats. So he'd read out their messages. Yeah. He was really, really effective. He kept his cool and he stayed absolutely consistent. Right. Now there's not, not many people would have been able to do that. Richard has that ability to be able to do that. Whether you like him or not, he has that ability. Yeah. And he will say himself that he's not a very likable person. A lot of people don't like him, but a lot of people tune in to listen to him. Listen to him. And you bet your bottom dollar that some of those people who initially went into Richard's comment section or Richard's chat to have a troll have gone away, thought about it, and are starting to think about making changes themselves. I uh, can bet you, I'll uh, bet you any money that uh, that will happen question. to some of those guys who were in that chat the other no night. No question about it. He's responsible for multiple thousands of vegans. So it's just, there's no question about it. And yeah, he has said things that I would consider, you know, not necessary. Um, yeah. But the overall message he delivers is... That's right true and consistent and ever yeah. based and he doesn't pander and he says what he feels he needs to say and yeah. he doesn't worry about too much about um 
you know, hurting people's feelings in the process. I know there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a line, there's a line, yeah. but you know, if you find that balance, you know, yeah. between delivering the strong message and not worrying about pandering too much, I think that that's really where you're going to get the really strong, effective message. Can we, that's right. um, do you think there are any, well, we've already discussed some of them, but do you think there are any big no-nos? Um, I think, I think committing crime as in, you know, forceful f physical violence, like going around, like hitting people okay. is not helpful. So I think, I think that line has to be drawn in terms of physical violence. Um, that's where I'd say, look, you know, you've gone too far. You, 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 you are doing the movement a disservice by going out on the streets with the intention of picking fights yeah. you're not there to keep you cool to deliver that message in a in a credible way mm -hmm. right if you are just going out there to pick a fight yeah. so i think that's the line that we in the vegan movement need to need to set down like that's that line in the sand that mm -hmm. you can go out there and be forceful you can go out there and and raise your voice if you need to and 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 use words you know that are incredibly blunt and powerful and are going to shock people but the line is drawn you don't assault people you don't threaten people and you don't i think also uh, making ad home attacks as well that that would i think that would also cross the line because that then dilutes the message because it dilutes, it dilutes it away from the message to you. And the thing that they'll go away remembering is that, well, there was this weird guy giving vegan, vegan activism on the street and he just ended up punching two people and calling someone a fat cow. And that's all they'll remember. They won't remember the message. But if you, if you have someone who's calm, professional, but forceful, right, that, that is the avenue. That is the thing that they'll take away. Yeah. And the avenue is down to the message rather than down to being put off by someone committing an act of violence in front of them. Yeah. So that's the line I would say. Yeah. yeah I, I agree with you there. I agree with you. There's certain things like commenting on someone's appearance or to bring them down mm. versus keeping it about the message. And that's like, right if like an activist might like, let's throw this into the mix an, an activist might call um, dairy farmer caught um, sort of doing an AI procedure on a cow. So that's right. That guy's a rapist. <laughs> you know, mm. I think when you say that you've got to explain to someone why you come to that conclusion. Yeah. You know? Yeah. When you call what happens to animals having their head cut off murder, I think that's pretty self-explanatory. But if you're just pointing at a farmer saying you're a rapist, right? They might mm. take that as because they haven't made that logical step. They might just think that you're labeling someone a racist, a rapist without evidence, like a yeah. rape or something. But when you explain like, what you do to that cows is rape. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. That logical step for them. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Um, I think, I think there are times such as that where you have to be careful with your wording. So if you go along to a farm and there are people who are witnessing this and you go in and call someone a rapist and an, an abuser and it, it just looks like a, a personal attack because you don't like them because they're a farmer. But if you, instead of saying you're a rapist, if you can say, do you understand that that behavior that you're committing looks very much like rape? And if you were doing that to a human female, would you consider that rape? So turn it around on them. Would you consider it rape to do that to a human female? Yeah. And they have to say yes. Mm. And then you say, well, why is it different mm. when you're doing it to a cow? So you're not, you've not, you haven't used the word rapist. You haven't called them a rapist. What you've questioned is the act that they're committing. Yeah. That's much more thought provoking to that person and anybody witnessing that than calling someone out and out a rapist.
Yeah, even I, though they are. I used to get phone calls all the time from different journalists and, and I would just say that I would never deny that that's rape. I will never yeah. deny that what they do to those cows through those cows eyes is rape. They're yeah. they being violated. They don't understand. It's, it's, it's horrible. So let's talk about um, for a second. Uh, I want to talk about agitation as an activism method, direct action, civil disobedient disruption. Um, and people who think that that makes the movement look bad. That can, that can, again, that, that has a fine line. Yeah. So if you have people who are going out committing acts of disruption and acts of um, disobedience, and it just looks like they're going out there to cause trouble with no clear message attached to it, that is pointless. Right, they're just going to get themselves arrested. No one's going to, no one's going to listen. Right, they're just going to, you know. And, and then if it comes out later that oh, it's a vegan activist group, yeah, mm, that doesn't kind of look good. Yeah. If if people are skilled enough to be able to go and disrupt, whether it's in the street, a supermarket, outside a slaughterhouse, wherever it might be, they're there to disrupt but they're also delivering a message to those people listening, that act of disruption in itself forces that message home. So it's an incredibly fine line. And I would say that people who are effective in that type of activism are perhaps special in that they are very skilled at it. I don't think just letting people go out and do that off their own back, it could very easily end in people people getting arrested for no good reason. Um, so I, I, I'd sit on the fence and say, if it's done well, it can be incredibly effective. Uh, but it has to be done well with a really calm, considered set of heads involved. So what I'm going to show you, Michelle, to comment on is this article um, that was written after an uh, event that we did. Here's the title here. It says, Militant Vegan Activists Storm Coals and Bombard Customers with Animal Abuse Videos in Attempt to Stop Them Buying Meat and Eggs. Okay. It goes on here to say... um, a militant vegan activist has accused coal shoppers of animal abuse during a confronting demonstration in the meat section. Uh, then it says, I stormed the coal supermarket with a bunch of activists dressed in black with, carrying TV screens. Um, here we are here, showing it to the supermarket staff. It says, look at this dairy cow being tortured and killed for milk. How horrific, he said in the front of the checkouts. Mr. Carbstrong told a shopper watching the screen, if you're paying for that, you're paying for animal abuse. So they go on. Uh, Here's another quote they quoted me. This is about that message thing you're telling us about. You've got to be vegan unless you like to torture animals for eggs. Why didn't Coles tell us that they sold tortured animal bodies, he questioned. (laughs) And then it shows, and then there's actually a video. Uh, So it goes on. Animals are being abused and killed so you can eat their flesh. It's disgusting. Um, People pay for dairy products. They're paying for the worst animal abuse on earth. And so we did it in front of Ben and Jerry's inside the supermarkets. And then... Michelle, they put in my disclaimer. A disclaimer on the YouTube video urged viewers to ask themselves a question if they found this protest too extreme, aggressive, or forceful. What's more extreme, aggressive, or forceful, the disclaimer read. Forcefully breeding billions of animals for the sole purpose of of forcing a knife into their necks and forcing them to die, or asking people to stop paying for it to happen. I also want you to ask yourself this. How quiet would you want us to be if you were the victim? And then they've got you know, images and video. So what do you think of this article in terms of that direct action? I think, I think in terms of the action itself, the action itself is incredibly powerful. So you were, and the group of people who you were with, were they calm, consistent, there was no aggression. Anybody who perceived that to be aggressive, well, that's on them. Right, there was no act of aggression there. Now, the fact that this is the Mail Online, <laughs> yeah. you know, they're not they're not well known for their accurate reporting, are they? They're not they're not well known for their 
their, their, their audience is a certain kind of person. So they're yeah. pandering to their audience. They're selling that newspaper, they're selling that advertising space to a certain kind of person. Yeah. A certain kind of person who, I'm probably being a little bit judgmental, who are not going to consider vegans or veganism or consider animal rights as anything that really needs to concern them. However, when um, those kinds of um, action get into the media, they spread with, obviously with the advent of the internet, they spread far, far and wide, way beyond the Daily Mail readership. 6,000 shares. So, so there you go. So how many of those 6,000 shares were people who were supporting you? Probably half of them, more than half of them who were actively saying, look at this, it's absolutely horrific, it's so aggressive, people are being abused when they're going out buying, buying eggs in coals. Well, a proportion of those who, who see that person saying, isn't that horrible, are going to be, perhaps at that moment in time, in denial, not ready to listen, as we said before, the ones shouting the most loudly, the ones who are prepared to share it, even though they think it's horrendous, are the ones who are having that backfire. However, they're the ones, I would argue, at some point in the future, that seed has been planted. Mm. So the Daily Mail are actually doing the vegan movement a favour by reporting on it in such a way, because they've actually used your words and used your, used your message, and it's there in black and white forever yeah. so, so that's yeah. it that, even if even if one percent of those six thousand shares went away and thought about it those are people who not only have, have got that seed but they've also gone further because once somebody invests time invests their own thought process you know cognitively invest their own thought processes into it they don't need any further persuasion they're they're there they're ready. And the people that, that, like everyone got the clear message in this, like it was, they didn't dress it up. They didn't attack my character. They reported this. They, I guess what they must have thought, this action, what I'm saying seems so outrageous to them that they didn't yeah. need to dress it up. They're like, well, just let's just quote exactly what he said, <laughs> you know? And, but the yeah. thing is, what I said is logical. Um, if you mm. follow it to its, if you follow the logical steps, to what I'm pointing on the mm. screen, the video is showing the chicks being ground up alive. Um, so 6,000 shares, a lot of the people are going to read this quote for quote and go, well, if you pay for dairy products, you're paying for the worst animal abuse on earth. Like, That's right. You know, like this, these, these messages have to fit in, um, sit in people's minds. And let's just say they're scrolling through Facebook one day, they see something about the dairy industry. Well, let's go see what this is all about. Oh, wow. That's what that exactly. guy on that article was talking about. And then they're scrolling again and they see something else. And like, this is how people get that initial seed planted. And then this, exactly. this psychological kind of phenomena can take place where the steps start to happen, you know? Exactly. So even though the Daily Mail might have reported on that as a form of, you know, sensationalism, as a look at what the vegans are up to, yeah. they have done the vegan movement a massive favor by publicizing it. Hmm. Um, whether they meant to or not yeah because that because you've been so consistent and clear and they've quoted you then that sits there in people's minds it sits there for people to come upon in six months time or whenever and read that message when they're ready to invest in it then they go away and learn more about it so whatever backfire you had from that um, that that action and that subsequent reporting, as we said, those people who have the most extreme reaction are perhaps the people who are the most passionate in what appears to be in the opposite direction than we want. But those are the ones who are prepared to invest the time in being outraged. Well, why are they being prepared to invest the time in being outraged? It's because they're covering up, they're in denial. Right. And once they've had time to go away, calm down, maybe months into the future, 
and they are prepared to listen, they'll come back to it. But there will be people who read that article who will say, really? Is the dairy industry really that bad? And have never really thought about it before. And will go and Google it and think, oh my God. And then they tell their friends, they tell their friends. Yeah. So the sure. Daily Mail have done, have done the vegan movement a huge favour. And I, 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 like, I like it when they report yeah. on, um, on things because it's all in our favour, it really is. And as, as long as, you know, the fact that you were, your, your group were calm and clear, holding up, you know, um, holding up the a respectful distance from people and being very consistent and clear with the message, that's all the Daily Mail could report. Yeah. If you'd gone in there punching people, then that would have completely defeated the object and you'd have ended up yeah. <laughs> in custody. That negative effect from it. So you said you do criminal psychology? Yeah. Okay. I've got a question for you. And this is something that come up when people compare me to more moderate activists or people that are, you know, and I, it, it, it springs to mind that our message is the same. It kind of like, you know how you got like the mum and dad approach to parenting, like dad, you're in big trouble for running out onto that road. Mum, look, you shouldn't have ran out onto that road, but come here, darling. Okay. Same message, different ones, coddling ones, you know, you know, direct, but, and with good cop, bad cop in interrogation rooms, you always got that one that sits back and he's like looking at him angrily and he's like, tell us what's going on. You shouldn't have done this. You, you, you raped her. You killed this woman, didn't you? Then the good cop's going like, look, we can get you out of this. We just want you to tell you, you know, what you did wasn't good and blah, blah, blah. So can we apply these two dichot like these two opposite sort of yin and yang to vegan activism as well? Like does one support the other or can you have a mixture of both? What do you think? I think a mixture of both works really well. Um, that the the person delivering the message is important. The, the most important thing, as I've said for the last like, hour, yeah. the most important thing is the message itself. Yeah. But how it's delivered depends, what's the most effective way to deliver the message depends on partly on the audience, partly on the location, so the, the, the setting. Yep. That the, the person who is more maybe more prepared to spend longer and to give a, a the good cop the good cop message they they work really well in a, a lecture room they'd work really well to go around and talk to people who were already seated waiting to listen whereas the bad cop who goes in right who is, is bang 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 this this is that this is what you're gonna do you're gonna listen you're gonna do they're they're better in direct confrontation or in where they you know they've got five minutes to yeah. deliver a message but i think what i think it's great that we have within the vegan movement people who use varying styles it helps with diversity it helps to show that vegans come in all shapes and sizes, age groups, education levels, backgrounds, social, you know, social, whatever. Um, and also, they are very different people, yet they're all saying the same thing. Yeah. And when, when it all boils down to, what, what is it they're actually saying? Well, actually, mum and dad are saying the same thing, aren't they? Yeah. And the good cop and the bad cop want the same outcome. Yeah. So they're delivering the message, but in a slightly different way. It kind of but reminds me of he... MLK versus uh, Malcolm. You know, they had the same kind of goal, or at some stages they had the same goal, and it's kind of like they... I heard this effect that the vegan couple made me aware of called the radical flank effect. And right. they were saying that the, that the radical flank effect is like, happened in the civil rights movement where there was a more radical um, civil rights activist, which made MLK seem more moderate. Um, so the radical flank sort of worked with the more moderate yeah. love based activists to like yeah. get to move towards the same goal. It's kind of reminds me yeah. of that. Yeah. And you find that in other types of civil rights movement, you'll find that in the gay rights movement, for example, um, that uh, in the nineties, the nineties, um, there were two groups. 
there was um, the kind of the, the people who were lobbying government and you know speaking at events and speaking at, at um, you know at, at changing laws you know get trying to trying to get laws changed and then you had outrage who were the more radical who'd be out there with placards and they'd be out there protesting and they complemented each other and those two movements used to argue and say oh you know go and go and stand in there with your placard you're just making us look silly what you should really be doing is going lobbying yeah. politicians but actually at the end of the day they're all there for the same for the same goal for the same outcome they're the good cop and the bad cop so i think it's i think it's fine and civil rights movements throughout history have probably had the same kind of setup where there'll be a radical element who are maybe to some of the less radical people I, I wish they'd just go away <laughs> but when you know they sit down and talk to each other they want the same things and they do actually complement each other because they're saying the same thing they're giving that consistent message across from different angles from different viewpoints but at the end of the day whether you're listening to the the outrageous radicals or whether you're listening to the people lobbying the politicians you're still getting the same message you're taking away the same message yeah so it's the same with um with the, the vegan movement i think yeah i've heard that um in the sit-in movement uh when they did that sit in the first initial one um other people of the same race were saying you're making us look bad you know, we're, trying, we're out here trying to do this love-based approach. You're making us look bad. This is too radical because they were getting spat on and things thrown at them and all of that. It's kind of yeah, symbolic yeah. of what you see in the movement. I think it's fine. And um, it, it, I don't think it does a movement a disservice at all. I think it, I think it supports, it complements a movement to have a, a, a section, small section of people who are, who are more radical than, than the rest. Amazing. Can we talk about, um, cause, uh, what, uh, Paul Bashir was talking about was, and what kind of what you're doing when you're having a conversation with someone and you want them to change instead of leaving them with just a thought, like I used to leave people with an open ended question and get them thinking and goodbye. I've got you to think now what we're trying to do more. So, uh, focus more so on is leave them with a sense of accountability, accountability that, okay. There is this stuff happening to animals. It's you're causing it when you fund these industries. You have to stop. Um, if, you, if not, you are then responsible for what's happening to these animals via mm. supply and demand. So th that sense of accountability, making them feel like the, they're, they're really the knife is in their hand, so to speak, mm. using that as their driving force to motivate them to change. What do you think of guilt being a part of that? you know, that accountability being a part of motivating change versus let's just say, um, they like you, you are persuasive, you got them to think and they really left the conversation feeling like, Oh, he was a nice guy. Mm. I think it's exactly the tactic that vegan gains used, um, with penguin okay. that he, he went out very forcefully, especially, and you could see it, especially in, in the live stream, that he was applying this is you you're responsible for this just because you're not the person doing the killing doesn't mean to say you're not responsible you're doing exactly what so young is doing by by eating the meat just because she's doing it on screen and the thing's still alive doesn't make you any less accountable yeah. for the death of the animal and it worked incredibly well in my opinion yeah. So I think asking people to be accountable, asking people are, I think probably demanding that they, that they be accountable is perhaps uh, on the, on the point where you think mm, maybe asking them is better than demanding them. So it could be like you say, um, well, if people, you know, you have a general conversation if people did not consume meat demand would go down they can they, they've got to agree with that and then you say well if you stopped eating it you, it's just one person but if we all did our bit and stopped eating it then therefore there wouldn't be a demand so leave them with 
it's your choice it's up to you to make that change it's up to you it's it's in your it's in your hands it's your what you choose to buy determines how you behave next yeah and so it's, it's 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 making them accountable but it's doing it in a way that is consistent with with the overall message yeah so there has to be logical steps to the reason that's why right that's, feel accountable. that's exactly you right to lead yeah. to the yeah. accountability it all comes back to you after you've led them through these this is the slaughter of the animals yeah find them up yeah. that's right on you that's right um, if you went in there and with with no backstory and you just went and demand you stop buying that meat now absolutely pointless yeah you've got to have that backstory you've got to have that conversation with them and you've got to lead them to that logical conclusion yeah and leaving them with that question you know it's it's up to you now what are you going to do about it are you going to make that choice yeah but that's come after that 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 backstory yeah interesting so it's all consistent so like for one of the things that keeps me vegan and is like, I could never, I could never go back on and do this to the animals. So like when people say that, you know, this accountability, this guilt as a driving force, not to, you know, I feel a bit guilty here, you know, like people have this idea that that's a bad thing for change. Like this guilty feeling is a bad thing. Like if you've offered them a solution and you've made them feel guilty for continuing to fund this industry that they claim to be against once you've got to that stage, wouldn't that guilt move people, motivate people more than just, let's just say accountability and you've, you've led them to the conclusion. They feel somewhat responsible. They feel this guilt versus pandering to their every emotion and not giving them a strong message of accountability and responsibility like, I just, do you feel like that, that, that one is much more motivational than the other or does it depend on the person? To be honest, I think a level of guilt is inevitable. Yeah. I think to make a change, I think you have to feel bad. Because if, if somebody has gone through their entire life, let's say they've got to the age of 25 consuming animal products and then they reach a point where they think, I don't want to do this anymore well why do they feel that they, they, they've, they've got to have that feeling of i've got to change i've got to do something and surely that's all tied up in guilt yeah surely it must be that i don't want to do this because i don't want to be responsible for it or i don't want to do this because you know my my moral judgment tells me that eating an animal is eating a dead body and it might as well be a, a, a dead human as a dead cow. What's the difference? There's no difference. What's the difference? It's horrible. It's dead. There has to be disgust and, and guilt and, and ugh. so you, you have to feel bad to have that motivation to change. Yeah. I, I, simple, I, I don't see how trying to make somebody feel good about it is, oh, is effective. No. It's, it's not effective. Yeah. I agree. So, with I agree with you. So, yeah. so that if pandering gets to the point where you've made someone comfortable with this action, this, this lifestyle that they've, they, if you, if you get to the point where you're pandering so much so that they feel better about it, I think that that's an error. I think that's, an yeah, error. yeah, yeah, yeah. It is an error. It is an error. It's talking to people who I've never thought about veganism before. If you're in that situation where you're planting that seed, you're that, you're that force that is planting that seed, you have got to dig the hole. So you've got to do something that initiates that first step. And that first step cannot be done in a way that makes them feel good. Not just. Because you've got to, you've got to, tell, you've got to tell them things that are not good you're t you're delivering a message of of death you're delivering a message and they can shoot the messenger they can they can turn it back on you and say you're the bad one but ultimately why are they feeling that it's because this thing is horrible they don't want to hear it actually why don't they want to hear it because it's horrible and and it becomes really 
it, it becomes a guilt trip yeah. because people, once they realize they can't feel good, they can't feel good about what they're doing. Yeah. Yeah. I if agree. they know what they're doing is, 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 is death. Is, yeah. is, it's inevitable. And it's like, you don't yeah. want to make people feel bad for this, but when you look at it through the animal's eyes and the victim's eyes, it's a necessary, it's a necessary thing. It has to, it is necessary. It, yeah. I think it is necessary yeah. but to, to deliver a message about billions of sentient creatures being slaughtered every year. I, I find it difficult to think of a way you could dress that up. So it doesn't sound horrific. Yeah. Oh, by the way, billions of animals are killed every year. Even that in itself sounds it's just like, whoa, really? Yeah. You can't yeah. deliver that in a in a nice way whilst still being effective. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. There there has to be you have to be un unapologetic with the message, but communication I think can be strategized i mean yeah. sometimes i look at myself and i go well i could have communicated the message better but as long as you're not you're you're not apologetic about the message itself you know That's but right. you're, you're strategizing on how to communicate that message i think they need to feel guilty they have to um be motivated to change the message has to be um unapologetic about exact talk to uh, very direct about what's going on and how they're yeah. responsible for it um so yeah, like I see Earthling Ed, he has a knack of delivering the unapologetic animal rights message in his own, with his own really intellectual communicative, you know, empathetic style. But yeah. if, you look, if you actually analyze his message, it's, it's really like explicitly a vegan message. He's not yeah, that's giving right. anyone a way out from that sort of thing. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So because Ed has got a, He's very personable, he's very likeable, he's very eloquent. Hmm. Ed works really well in situations where he's got an audience, where he can talk to people, can sit down, have a conversation, but he's still delivering the same message yeah. that you do when you do a five-minute interview where yeah. you're accused of interrupting someone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's the same message. So although the delivery style is different the personality behind the message is different they are still the same message yeah. that someone can go away research for themselves yeah. and can't refute it you just can't refute it that's it so that's before it. we um before we go i just wanted to quickly talk about like let's just say you're the person delivering the message right and you're unapologetic in the way that you deliver it uh, in the message itself is unapologetic. You're saying that you're abusing these animals when you, if you, if you consume their body parts and you pay for their body parts, you have to stop, you know, keep making them feel accountable. And someone says to you, let's just say there's some other vegans or, you know, someone says to you, well, you're not perfect. So you can't, who are you to ask someone to make this moral change when you haven't been perfect in your life either, which is a lot of my past isn't perfect. And I'm, Mm. about that your t-shirt might have some suffering down the line you cause crop deaths do veganism itself isn't perfect who are you to ask people to make moral decisions when you're not a saint what what do you mm. think about that mm. i've made a lot of videos about these kinds of things like people come into my comment section talking about well vegans are responsible for crop deaths and so on and i think that there comes a time when you've got to say yes we know we live in a non-vegan world. Mm. We live in a, a situation, we live in a, a, a time and a place where unfortunately farming methods kill animals. Mm. And we can't, we can't apologize for that. We can say, well, we've got to, as a movement, move forward and think about ways that things like farming practices can be made more ethical. Yeah. So it's perhaps more about not denying that there's no such thing as perfection, that the fact that, you know, we're talking using technology that might have been produced with the use of uh, children, you know, doing, doing lab laborious tasks um, in sweatshops. Well, actually, what we've got to think about is 
that does not that's that's an issue in itself that's an issue that people can work to to change to farm to to create solutions to to move forward with that particular issue but when you're looking at um if somebody's using those arguments against you then i i like it because it means that they're engaging on an ethical level so you can say to them i know that farming isn't perfect i know that crop deaths exist however if you think about it who are the majority of the crops fed to they're fed to farm animals so it's not just vegans that are responsible for crop deaths it's not just vegans that are responsible for something that might occur during a manufacturing process however i'm really pleased that we're having a discussion about ethics i always come back to i'm really pleased that you're willing to have a discussion about ethics mm. because the more we question unethical practices of any kind mm. the more as a, a global community we can seek solutions for them or at least seek towards solutions for them what about so, if you don't have a right michelle like if they say you don't have a right like to speak the way you do unapologetically because you haven't been perfect and because you're not perfect like do you think that that negates the right do you think because no one is can truly be completely perfect um that that negates your right to speak unapologetically for direct victims like animals and i always think look, look like like children or animals that are being tortured and killed because of someone's mm. direct choice like but they're saying you don't have a right because you're not perfect like you know what i mean like and even mm. vegan in the movement there might be some vegans a lot of not not all but some might say we well, you're not perfect either so why are you being so hard on them you know what i mean mm. you don't have the right mm. to be hard on this person and to make them feel responsible and accountable because you know, you haven't always been perfect kind of thing. You know, you can't have this militant yeah. view and militant stance. Yeah, but um, I think it's about being, being unapologetic and using it as a form of kudos that, yeah. yes, I've done things in my past mm. that I'm not proud of, but I've learned from it. So you might be in a situation now where you don't feel good about the meat that you're consuming you don't feel good about the way that you're feeling right now about animal slaughter yeah. but what can we do together what can we do as a community what can we do as a group of people to to seek those solutions so i'm not perfect you're not perfect we don't have to be perfect however what we are focusing on is what we can change right now. Yeah. And I, 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 I just go back to this is what we can change right now. Mm. This is in our hands. This is something that we have as, as an individual, we can choose not to buy meat. We can choose not to buy milk. Mm. Uh, unfortunately, at this moment in time, there's not a lot we can do about farmers using certain practices that result in rodents being killed during a harvest. We can work with farmers to seek solutions moving forward, but there is something you can do right now. You can choose not to buy that steak. You can choose not to eat that bacon. Mm. So again, bringing it back to them, making them accountable for what they can change, Mm. whilst acknowledging yeah we live in a non-vegan world none of us are perfect we can't possibly counteract every single possible line of discomfort or abuse that might have occurred at some point during our lifetime that we have indirectly contributed to by buying a laptop however there are certain things that we can do right now we can make certain choices whether it's consumer choices, whether it's ethical choices, choices of principle that we can do and also you can do. So why aren't you doing it? Yeah. I also, that's what I, 
it's kind of like a um it's kind of like they're trying to make uh everyone else out as a hypocrite so that it doesn't yeah. so that everyone's on the same moral plane but that's right you actually analyze it if an ex gang member was unapologetically speaking out for children they wouldn't do that to the person because they would appreciate that someone was there defending the children in the world from predators and evil people. Um, mm. But for this read, like, cause I've actually been asked from people to say, Hey, Joey, if you're an ex gang member and you used to deal drugs, why don't you speak out against gang violence and drug dealing? I would support you then stop talking about the cruelty in meat and start talking about that. It's kind of like they, they want to, me to stop getting in their ear about this because they feel yeah. like this is something they're guilty of or something. Yeah. But they it's like, well, wait a second. If I'm a hypocrite for asking you to stop uh, paying for the cruelty of animals, wouldn't I still be a hypocrite to gang members and drug dealers for asking them to stop doing that? Because I used to be one too. So that yeah. I can win. So what are you asking yeah, yeah. me to do? Not be, yeah. not point out obvious immoral things that greatly, you can greatly reduce your suffering and violence and eliminate the exploitation by a like huge amount, magnitude. You can't measure the, the amount of, you know, crop deaths and resources and suffering in a steak comparative to a handful of rice. It's just, it's just a, a really bad uh, comparison. Like, why is it that because you know, you have small imperfections or things that you've done wrong in your past and you, you've, you've tried to mend and we're all trying to do better that you can't speak out about some obvious Holocaust of innocent beings. It's just seems mm. insane to me. Mm. Yeah, but it's, it's the, it's the same as, um, you know, they can't, they can't counteract the message. They can't deny the message. So mm. they've got to find something to make them feel better. Mm. turn it back on you well why are they doing that because they feel guilty yeah why are they having to go through mental gymnastics to think about things that might be wrong in your life or that you've done wrong in the past why are they even taking that cognitive effort to do that yeah because they feel guilty because the message that you've told them is hit, is at some level hit home yeah. so the more they shout and scream and, and try and turn the tables back, keeping your message consistent doesn't change it. All it does is tell them that mm, that's not work. That avenue's not worked. Um, maybe it's me. Maybe it's me that's got the problem. And they're not going to do that in front of you. They're not going to do that right whilst you're there confronting them. But at some point in the future, they well might. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining me for this, Michelle. I really appreciate it. And thanks for sharing your knowledge on social change and psycho uh, different aspects of psychology. I really appreciated it. And thanks for all your work you do. You're very welcome. Thank you. And keep up the great work. Thank you very much. Take care. See ya. Bye. <laughs>